Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, uh, I think the the Nordic countries they can be proud, I guess, of many things, but one area where we are all all the Nordic countries are at the top, it's gender equality. In all these measurements about gender equality, which say now Iceland is at the top from the World Economic Forum, but a couple of years ago it was Sweden. But it's always the Nordic countries up there. So, I mean, gender equality has been very important in the Nordic countries and will be also in the future, I guess. Now, I'm, I, um, um, uh, I, I don't know uh, if uh, I'm going to speak about this, about the economic crisis. And I, maybe Iceland was exceptional or not. I don't know that, actually. But I think numbers are very important. As I asked before about uh, the... I, we have in Sweden and probably also in Iceland then, that we have individual disposable incomes for women and men, not only a household income. And that is very important, I think, if you are working with gender equality. Uh, and this is also a bit about numbers, what, what I want to speak about. Now let's see this. No? No? <laughs> Which one? It's that one. That one? Yes. The last one. So, I mean, it's often said, as the example from Iceland too uh, showed, is that uh, in an economic recession, men lose comparatively more jobs than women. And this is because of the gender-segregated labor market. Men are in the private sector, in construction, manufacturing, and nowadays also in male-dominated uh, parts of the financial sec sector. While women work with uh, care and, and health and education in the public sector. Uh, and usually then, the men are lose jobs uh, and, uh, and women are more... Are more in the stable uh, parts of the economy in the public sector. So that uh, when they had checked this in the EU countries, they found that where gender segregation was greater during the recession in the late 2000s, then men lost more jobs in those countries. So in the Nordic countries, we have a we have a gender segregated labor market. We also have a very big public sector, so women should do comparatively well. But I would like to question that. But I'm I'm not sure that is true actually, or true. But it could be questioned uh, anyway. Uh, I'm not so sure women are so protected in the in the public sector. And this shows, this is a long, um, it shows the employment rate for women and men in Sweden from 1963 until today. Uh, and uh, uh, so that it, between 1963 and 1990, you can see for men it goes up and down with the economic uh, cycles. But for women it was going up all the time. And it, when there was bad times, when there was a recession, it slowed down the increase, but it was still increasing all the time. And this was mainly because of the public sector. The, the public sector was expanding at this time. So almost all women that went into the labor market at that time, they went to the public sector. So at that time you can say that the public sector was very helpful for women. And it was especially in the municipalities. The state sector is small in Sweden, but the municipalities is a big sector. But then you can see what happened in 1990. And I know in Finland you had a very bad experience in the beginning of the 1990s too, and we did in Sweden too, but not as bad as in Finland actually. But it was bad. So you can see that the employment rate goes down right down, both for women and men. And after 1990, the, the ups and downs in the, uh, econom in the economy uh, affects women and men uh, more or less in the same way. But there's different timings in it. But it goes up and down. Uh, but when you can also see that for men, 
in, between 1990 and 1993, the, it's steeper. The, the employment rate went down faster for men than for women. And you can also see that uh, it was down for men, the bottom was more or less in 1993, but for women it was in 1997. So there is a different timing in the, what happens to employment for women and men. And then if we go to the, to the um, um, crisis in 2009, 2008, 2009, 2010 in, in Sweden and other countries, but in Sweden that, uh, the, it's much smaller, you can see, <laughs> compared to the 1990s. But uh, you can see again that uh, the employment rate for men goes down faster than for women. So the bottom for men was in 2009, for women it was 2010. So it comes later. And I think this is um, uh, one problem when you measure um, uh, what happens in an economic recession. It is that, and you usually measure, which showed from Iceland, the, the different, the change in employment in quarters. And of course, then if you have a very short time where you measure the em, em, employment rate or unemployment rate, then you measure more of men's down than women's. So the, this difference in timing, I think, is important to take into consideration. Uh, now, if you look at the different sectors, these are the municipalities, and this is the number of employees uh, in the municipalities in Sweden. And it starts in 1990, and then we had this dif uh, difficult economic situation in the beginning of the 1990s. And as you can see, it goes down quite a lot for women. It goes down for men too, but it's not so important because the, the, not so many men are, are employed in the uh, public sector. And then you can also see um, in 2008-9-10, it goes down again for women uh, at that time. For men, actually, at that time, it goes up. It, or it didn't happen much. Uh, so, so with this background, actually, I would say that the public sector uh, helped women a lot up until 1990, but since then it's more doubtful if it does. So if, I mean, if you have budget consolidation and authority politics, then it's not a good idea to be in the public sector. And that is what has been happening in, maybe not in Iceland, but in many EU countries. We are saving money and there are budget cuts. And then women are hit. But not as fast. Men go down first and women later on. Uh, so this is in the private sector. And there you can see that uh, it's steeper for men in the 1990s. In the beginning of 1990s it goes down. It goes down for women too. But not so much. And then later on there is also a dip. 2009 and 10 for men and also a little one for women. Uh, but the, actually, if we take all the, or, or the here, the, if we look at the change in number of employees from 1990 until today, women lost 141,000 jobs in the public sector, in the municipalities. Men lost 4,000. So that was not, I mean, it didn't save women in the public sector. But the private sector, on the other hand, uh, women, uh, the change in the number of employees in the private sector for women is 2,700 uh, people. And for men, it is about 100,000. So it's the, the increase for women was much bigger than for men, if you compare these two years. And then there is uh, the state sector, which is quite small. Uh, so the increase for women was 31,000, and for men about 3,000. And altogether, it's, for women, it was uh, an increase of 96,000, and for men about 99,000. You know, it's not a big difference. Altogether, it's more or less the same. Uh, now you can wonder, what, why did it increase in the private sector so much for women? And one explanation is, of course, that uh, it's the service sector. 
and women work much more in the service sector than in construction and manufacturing. So that is one explanation. Another explanation is this marketization. So, so <laughs> uh, uh, jobs were transferred from the public sector to the private sector. It's still paid by taxes, but it's done in the private sector. How much that is, it's difficult to know. But, and then I think another a third uh, um, um, explanation for women's uh, increase in the private sector and maybe especially in the state sector, is that women is much more well educated than men are. And this is the case in, in all European countries. Um, so that, that was, um, and then another way I think is problematic in, in when it comes to, to measurement of uh, economic crisis and the effects on, um, on women and men in the labor market. And this is unemployment in Sweden. And there you can see that in the beginning, it was quite low. It was like in Iceland in the end of the 1980s, was about 2%. We're never going to get back there, I think. But then in the 19, beginning of the 1990s, it goes up very much, and it goes up much for, faster for men, or it goes up faster for men than for women. And the peak is for men in 93 something, and for women later on in 1997. And then when it comes to the one in 2008, 9, and 10, again, it goes up faster for men, and then women comes a bit later. And uh, so the peak is, um, the peaks are diff in different, there's different timing of the, of the peaks. Uh, but almost the whole period of time uh, from 1987 until today, men's employment rate is higher than women's. But that has uh, quite a lot to do with how unemployment is measured, I would argue. And this is underemployed, the share of underemployed people. And this is, uh, uh, especially among women, uh, as you probably know, in Sweden, quite a lot of women, and well, in, not in Finland, but in other Nordic countries, women work quite a lot part-time. But there is also a lot of... The, the, the most uh, uh, common reason why women in Sweden work part-time is that they can't find more job. It's not taking care of children. It is that they, they can't get more hours. So... And you can also see that in the beginning of the 1990s, when there, this was this economic crisis, uh, the number of people or the share of underemployed in the labor force goes up. So even the underemployed is going, it's, it changes with the, the economic uh, ups and downs. Uh, and it's much higher for women than for men, except at the very end. But if you only measure unemployment as people who are full-time unemployed, then you get the, not the complete picture. Because so many more women are underemployed or part-time unemployed than men. And men are, um, many of the men who are underemployed, they actually work full-time, but they would like to work more hours. So that is also a difference. Um, and a lot of this part-time unemployment, uh, together with temporary employment, is in the public sector. So in, that in this case too, I mean, it, uh, the public sector is not that good for women's uh, conditions of employment, actually. So the fact that women are affected later than men in an economic recession and that the whole picture of unemployment is not taken into consideration means that the effects on women's employment and unemployment are underestimated compared to men's. And this is not only in Sweden, it's also in many other EU countries. And this also means that the public sector, as a protector of women's employment, is overestimated, I would say. I would like to uh, show two more, I think it is. Uh, 
uh, in the Nordic countries, we have been working for gender equality for a long time. And the strategy has mainly been gender mainstreaming. But nowadays also, it's uh, quite a lot of talk about gender budgeting. And I know that in Finland, you are working on this now. I don't, I don't know how far you got, but... And in Sweden, we are working with this also. And some time ago, I, I was involved in looking at the budgets. And, uh, and then one way I thought, uh, I mean, it's a simple way, and it's not at all uh, full or um, complete or anything. But what I did is, was simply that I looked in all the budget bills how often if you're going to gender mainstream or gender budget your budget, then you, you usually you have to use the word jämstel, gender equality, and women or kvinnor. So I just looked simply how many times are women and gender equality mentioned in the budget bills. And I looked from 1980 to uh, until today. And you can see in the beginning it. it not, nothing much was happening. But then uh, towards uh, in the beginning of the 2000s, it started to increase. Then in 2006, we had a new government, a more conservative government. And then it goes down. But they also won in the election in 2010. And then they started to use this. So it goes up. And now we have a social democratic green uh, uh, government, and they use this quite a lot. So, he, I mean, in some way, maybe you can see what is happening a bit about how important gender is in the budget, and of course the budget is extremely important for resources and, and labor market policy and everything. And actually, in the, in the latest, in the two latest uh, budget bills, since the Swedish government calls itself a feminist government, they even use the word feminist in the budget bill. So, <laughs> okay, so, so gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting is important, but I think we also have to look for male norms in the concepts and how things are measured such as unemployment and the timing of economic recessions in relation to gender in order to better understand the gendered effects. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Anita. That was really an interesting presentation and uh, my immediate uh, impression was that it sort of followed Sandy's sort of fit in the build that the, the, the idea that Sandy put on this this uh, marketizing uh, economy coming into the area where state used to be and and um, and and doing the gender budgeting and looking in these uh, ways to measure is extremely important. We have a few minutes before the coffee break, so if you have a short questions to Ayla or Anita, so please go ahead. Yes, Pia. Okay. You need you need to have the please the, the microphone. No, the complicated uh, question yeah. regarding uh, Iceland. Because as far as I can see from the history, Iceland went as far as you could in neoliberal policy before the crisis, right? And then by surprise, during the crisis or after the crisis, you went almost headlong back to the Nordic road, right? And you were doing reforms in the opposite direction of any of the other Nordic countries which were cutting down taxes on, on high marginal incomes. They were cutting down on times you could be on employment benefit and social insurance. They were making it bad for people who were in bad situations. 
in order to push them into the labor market where they were queuing up of unemployed people. In Denmark, the only rationality you could find for doing that was to keep interest rates low so the young families who had bought high-priced houses would not collapse, right, which they had done in the early 80s. So, what were you thinking about interest rates? Because you had to borrow a lot of money. Why didn't you fear the financial markets? I know that later in history, the financial institutions came back and were willingly financing the, the Icelandic adventure. But how did you dare it? You didn't explain that. <laughs> it's not from what mother learned you. <laughs> how did you dare it? Hello, do you have an answer for that? <laughs> you do know that we live on volcanoes, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's too easy. <laughs> but uh, when, you, when you actually say that this was neoliberal policies, um, I, I do have difficulties with stating that anything that we're doing here in the Nordic countries compares to, <laughs> to the neoliberals uh, uh, in, in the US. Um, when I say that our party right in the government called the Independence Party, they would be, uh, they're way off to the left of the Democratic Party in the US. You cannot compare uh, uh, the politicians in, in the Nordic countries to, for example, the politicians. You know, when I meet Rep uh, Republicans uh, from the US, I don't understand them. It's, I feel like they're coming from another planet. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm like in the center of Icelandic politics. And um, so what I hope, but I'm not sure that all of the countries in the world have learned that uh, financial crises come because we borrow too much money. It's just as simple as that. We borrow too much money. And uh, and we were lucky enough that in the way that our banks had become so big that we couldn't save them. It wasn't because we decided not to save them, we just couldn't. We were too small. And, and that's what, uh, when you look at, for example, the US, or you look at the UK, or you look at Denmark, you saved your banks. You made the taxpayers pay for uh, the financial risk taking of the bank banksters, as we call them in Iceland. And uh, so the mummy state worked there. Um, so, um, so I hope that we will never go back there. But, but, I'm, I'm, but, I'm, but <laughs> you can see that in retrospect. I can see that now in retrospect. But I, I think also a lot of, uh, if you look at the way that, that uh, for example, the, Iceland, the bonds of the Icelandic banks was valued before the crisis, uh, that there were there were analysts there that were concerned that they knew that the, the our central bank or the state could not back the Icelandic banks up. That's why they were paying higher interest. That's why they were concerned concern, considered to be higher risk than a lot of other banks. And um, so, uh, uh, so as you when you ask how come we could could allow that to happen, um, I think we were naive. We trusted too much. And um, and yeah, and maybe in some ways that that living on volcanoes and living in Iceland, that we we like to take risks, but I hope that has changed. But but I'm not the, sure. I'm I'm sorry, <laughs> but because this is so interesting, because you could see that in a way, at the, the current situation in Europe, the financial uh, system holds Europe in a grip, imposing austerity uh, as a way out, savings when you don't need savings, right? Uh, and which undermine growth, which undermine uh, the, the, the consolidation of our, our economy. And your lesson is, forget about it. Don't play after the rules of the financial system. If you don't obey you are not ruled by them, right? And, and I think that, that's, that's a really good point, because if you also look at what the IMF has been saying, you know, uh, in the last maybe couple or three years, 
they've been saying exactly that. They, they have been saying to the European Union, this doesn't work. You have to think about your people. Mm. If, if, uh, if, if the anger becomes, becomes too much, and they told us this also in, you know, in, in discussions when we were you know, asking what to do, they, they were very concerned that uh, in order to be able to, to implement the things that we had to implement to govern, they say you do have to take care of your people. Because if, if not, you know, if you lose all trust in, in the society and, and all the, you know, the institutes of the society, you will not be able to do what you need to do. And that's what we, in a way, you can see that happening in a lot of countries. And I think that was one of the lessons they took from, from working in Asia during, during the crisis in Asia. And, and we were lucky enough to, to um, being able to implement those lessons. And not only that, but because we had the Nordic countries as the partners in the program, there was also a lot of understanding of the importance of welfare. Uh, if, uh, if we would have had Russia in the US, I'm not sure we would have been able to do what we had, <laughs> what we did as partners. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, at least we can conclude that uh, Icelandic people are really brave and, and you live on an island in the middle of Atlantic uh, and with volcanic, volcanic things. So I think you, 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 you can take whatever. <laughs> uh, and if you know how, do you know how many people live on Iceland? The size of the population. When Ella said that they uh, were good doing things and, and the bankruptcy was one of the largest in the world and, and there is like 334,000 people that managed to do the, one of the largest bankruptcies. Uh, so, um, no, it's not, but, but, but it, at least it means that you do things really properly when you do something and, and you are brave. <laughs>